What is going on everyone? It's Sean with All Things EV and in this video I want to highlight a new EV car company called Byton. I've been aware of them for, I don't know, maybe a year or two, but while I was at the LA Auto Show, I was able to see their car or cars in person, the M-Byte and the K-Byte. But for this video, I want to focus on the M-Byte since it's the one that has been around the longest. I'll break this video down into three sections, one being the tech specs, two, the performance, and three, the financial and leadership side of things. And it's really, really interesting to dig in a little bit more to this company. I'll touch on that in just a moment, but let's dive into some of the tech specs because they're quite impressive. One of the things that you notice when you look at the inside of this car is this massive 49 inch by 10 inch display that sits on the dash behind the steering wheel. And just like Rivian is trying to carve out a new niche called the electric adventure vehicle, so is Byton with what they say is the world's first smart intuitive vehicle and the technology in this car or the technology that they plan to put in this car is pretty impressive. Aside from the massive display on the dash, you're greeted with a whole host of tech forward features like gesture recognition to control the massive display, facial recognition, and voice recognition. And they say that they have plans to partner with Amazon's Alexa, but it will also talk to your smartphone as well as wearables. It will include a thousand megabit per second data speed, and from day one will include level three autonomy. The size of this vehicle seems to be closer to a Tesla Model X than a Model S with a length of 191 inches. If you compare that to the Model X, Model X is 198 inches, so a little bit longer. The Model S is 196 inches. So both of Tesla's premium offerings are longer. The height of this M-Byte will be 65 inches, and the Model X 66, and the Model S 56, with a wheelbase of 116 inches. And if you compare that to the X, it's 116.7 inches, and the S is 116.5 inches. The battery size for the Imbite will come in two offerings, one at the 71 kilowatt hour level and two at the 95 kilowatt hour level. The 71 kilowatt hour battery will get you 250 miles with 250 horsepower and 295 pound feet of torque. When you compare that to Tesla's Model X 75 kilowatt hour, it's 237 miles, and the S gets you 259 miles. The M-Byte's 95 kilowatt hour battery pack will get you 325 miles with 470 horsepower and 524 pound-feet of torque, and Tesla's Model X 100D will get you 295 miles, and the Model S 100D 335 miles. What about its charging capabilities? It will have DC fast charging, and they say it will be able to charge 80% of the battery in 30 minutes. However, they don't mention what their charging infrastructure will be like if they will develop their own or rely on third-party charging networks. Production will first start in China and be available to the Chinese market in 2019 and US and Europe in 2020. They say it'll have a starting price of 45,000 US dollars, which seems a little bit too good to be true, especially knowing all that's on the market currently and their offerings. The Model S starts at $78,000 before tax incentives here in the US, which gives Byton's M-Byte a nearly $30,000 cut on the lowest level Model S. I would not be surprised if the M-Byte starts ten dollars or $15,000 more than what they're saying right now at that $45,000 level. Again, it just seems too good to be true. The front seats will actually rotate 12 degrees inward towards each other to give the people in the back of the car a better view of the 49 inch screen. What I haven't been able to determine yet is will those seats rotate if there is a driver in the driver's seat actually manually driving the car versus the car driving autonomously? To me, it seems like these rotating seats are most ideal for when the car is driving itself. It'd be a little bit awkward if you had the driver's seat rotated 12 degrees towards the center of the car 
and still driving at the same time. But if you think about the large display and how the seats rotate inwards, it really seems like they're designing the car for autonomy. And for this to be a mobile entertainment pod that gets you around from place to place while keeping you connected to the internet and friends and family. And to be quite honest, I think this is where automobiles are heading as autonomy becomes better and better. You won't need to be facing forward. You might be able to be facing the back seats or facing each other and the chairs will rotate and you'll have this massive screen in the car to be able to display the internet, social media, and probably movies and video games. Now let's take a look at funding for Byton because that says two things to me. Number one, the level of confidence from the investor's standpoint. Number two, how much cash they have on hand for R&D, for marketing, and more importantly, production. According to Crunchbase, they've raised three series, Series A in July of 2016, a venture round in August of 2017, and a Series B round in June of 2018, and that one is at $500 million, all three rounds totaling $700 million. How does that compare to some other new EV startups? Well, the fledgling Faraday Future has raised two rounds at $2 billion. Lucid Motors has raised four rounds at $1.1 billion. And Rivian Automotive, whose product reveal launch I was at just last week, has raised three rounds at $201 million, which seems actually extremely low there. And the big giant in the room, Tesla, has raised 28 rounds and totaling $14.5 billion. So it's, it's really clear that if any of these companies want to compete with the largest player in the market, Tesla, they're gonna have to raise a lot more money. Their headquarters and where they will be producing the car will be in Nanjing, China, but with offices in California, Germany, and China. It seems like the bulk of investment money for Biden is primarily Chinese, which I find really, really interesting. We'll dive into the leadership, which I think will also give some additional insight into the company. Let's talk about some of their executive leadership. The company has been co-founded by two individuals, the CEO, Karsten Breitfeld, who has a PhD in mechanical engineering. He's a 20 year veteran of BMW and was the head of the i8 program. The president and other co-founder Daniel Kershert was the managing director of Infinity China. He was also the SVP of sales for BMW Brilliance Automotive Limited, which is the joint venture between a Chinese automotive company and BMW. He also ironically went to Nanjing University and currently lives in China. CFO Albert Lee is a 30 year automotive and aerospace veteran. He was a VP at Bombardier Inc., a Canadian aerospace and transportation company, as well as VP and CFO of Ford China. Their current head of global supply chain, Tom Westner, is a 30 year automotive executive who has worked at Faraday Future president of procurement at Hawaiian Airlines, purchasing and sourcing at Tesla for the Model S, and a 23-year veteran of Ford. Their head of China Tech and Industrialization, Zhan Wang Ying, was the executive at Changyan Automotive Co. Limited, a Chinese state-owned car maker and considered one of the big four of China. Their head of external affairs, public relations and governmental affairs, Ding Qingfen, headed up public relations for Infinity China and also used to work for state-owned China Daily covering the Chinese premiere. Head of design, Benoit Jacob, was the VP of design at BMW Group who designed the i3 and i8, and he also worked at Renault and Volkswagen Group. Head of marketing, Henrik Winders, was responsible for marketing the BMW i3 and i8. The head of powertrain and autonomous driving, Dr. Dirk Abenroth, has a PhD in communication networks and also has worked for BMW developing their hybrid and electric powertrain technology. Head of intelligent car experience, Jeff Chung, led systems engineering teams at Apple. Head of digital technology, Abe Chen, 
worked at Tesla as Director of Information and Product Security, as well as led Apple's new product security team. And lastly, user interface and user experience head Wolfram Luschner used to work at Google's X self-driving project and was senior designer at Daimler Automotive and GM. So there's no doubt that this leadership team is well capable of producing an electric vehicle. In fact, it seems like there's a lot of talent from BMW. It sort of makes me wonder what happened there with BMW. Perhaps these people who joined Byton did not see enough exciting things on the electric side, so they decided to leave for a future that was a little bit more bright in terms of electric mobility. The other point that I noticed about this executive leadership team is it has close ties to Chinese automotive executives. And that makes a lot of sense to me since the company is primarily funded by Chinese investors. Knowing just a little bit about the US Chinese political climate, I'm not entirely certain how well they'll do in the US. There is this stigma, appropriate or not, with Chinese products. And since this car is funded by Chinese investors and has close ties to the Chinese automotive market, which by the way, has extremely close ties to the Chinese government, I have some doubt doubts about how well they'll do in the US. And since the US is closely tied to Europe, I have some question about how well they'll do in the European market as well. However, if they just focus on the Chinese market, I think they could be an extremely dominant player in the EV automotive space. I've got a lot of high hopes for this company. I like some of the things that they're doing with the technology inside of the car. It seems like the battery technology in this car is very forward thinking and could be extremely competitive with tech Tesla and other front runners in the EV space. It'll be interesting to see what they do with charging and charging network. That's a big variable that it seems like a lot of new EV car companies have yet to decide. Are they going to create their own EV charging network or are they going to rely on third party stations? Tesla has done a remarkable job with their owners at setting this expectation with consistency of experience at superchargers and being able to charge at a high rate of speed of 120 kilowatts, which by the way, could likely change and improve here in the first quarter of 2019 as Tesla introduces their version three supercharging. If this large 49 inch display at the front of the car ends up being primarily controlled by voice and gesture, I'm not sure how interactive that will be. I think there's a really good reason why we haven't seen widespread adoption of gestures as a way to control our experience and interaction with the internet. And so I think it's a really interesting strategy on Byton's part to use this as the primary way to control that 49 inch display. I do like the idea, however, of facial recognition to access the car and its features. I wonder how effective this will be if they use this as the primary way to get into the car, a lot like iPhone's Face ID. Imagine not needing a key or device at all to unlock the car, but using facial recognition to get access to it. Imagine if you live in a wintry part of the world and you're trying to use facial recognition to unlock the car and actually get into the car, snow and ice can have a large impact on those cameras, potentially covering up the cameras completely and preventing you from getting into the car. Now, I don't doubt that they've thought about redundancies, so maybe they'll use low energy Bluetooth on your smartphone, or at a last resort, use the car's push button on the doors to access the inside of the car. The thing I'm most interested in seeing is how they'll implement Amazon's Alexa into the car. I think there's a lot of potential there. And as this technology gets better and better, it could actually control the entire car, including all of its functions. When all is said, I think Byton has a very strong chance at being a global competitor in the EV space, regardless of whether they make it to the US and European markets. It seems like they've really got a handle on the technology and their leadership team is very well experienced in the automotive space. But like a lot of you who watch my channel, I'm approaching Byton cautiously, but optimistically, especially knowing how many difficulties Tesla has had with getting a single car off the production line and into customers' hands. I really appreciate you taking the time to watch this video. I hope you found it informative. If you're new to my channel, please consider subscribing. And if you're a regular, hit that like button and I'll see everyone on the next video.